It's happening. Yes. All right. Yeah. So we'll kick it off. So I, I, I maybe I just said a, a, just a few words really to say um, that this is the first ever um, telco in Asia Pacific uh, time zone. We normally have India the other way, right? All the way over to uh, the West Coast of the US. So it's very exciting to have uh, uh, this first one in this period. And I think Bipin, as the chair, I'll, let, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, and we have a great speaker today. So Bipin, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Julian. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Bipin Rati, and I'm chair of this Telecom Sync. And um, so the goal of this uh, telecom sig is to discuss more use cases of blockchain in telecom space. And uh, quick introduction, like we wrote two solution brief, one of uh, like one on uh, intercarrier settlement, second is on IoT. And uh, today we have a talk on IoT as well. So, uh, and uh, the second one is more on the IoT is decentralized ID and access management for IoT networks. We have a bi-weekly calls every Thursday and, uh, and we have a guest speakers. And today, this is the first call in Asia Pacific. And today we have Ali. Thanks Ali for, uh, for accepting our request. Ali is in as a research fellow at uh, Queensland University of Technology, and uh, today he will talk about blockchain adaptation in the Internet of Things. Thanks, Ali, and floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So I guess um, I can share my screen if. So can you see the slide now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Thanks Julian and um, Vipin for inviting me and having me here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, blockchain adaptation in the Internet of Things. Uh, my talk would be more focused on the um, challenges and difficulties we have in adopting blockchain, blockchain in the IoT context. So, oops, yeah, let's uh, discuss very briefly what is Internet of Things. So. Um, IoT is basically um, the board around us, which is getting more connected and more connected. So as we have more devices uh, capturing information about uh, our daily lives and sending this information to say service providers where that this data is being captured, processed, and um, then some results being sent back to the devices uh, that can be like certain actions or some services offered to us. IoT is uh, becoming more and more popular with the um, sort of services it is offering and the number of IoT devices is uh, increasingly um, is increasing in uh, each each and every year. And of course this day uh, this huge number of devices will capture a huge volume of uh, information about our daily lives about different aspects um, our day and of our daily life um, which are shared with the service providers. Currently, um, the IoT ecosystems uh, basically relies on a three-tiered architecture where we have the low resource low powered or resource available IoT devices like the sensors or even your smartwatch um, connecting to a gateway, which can be in this example we have here, it can be like your mobile phone. Uh, the data captured by the IoT devices has been sent to the gateway and then the gateway will send it to a cloud service provider for processing and for their uh, services that they offer. So the main aim of having this three tier architecture is that because the IoT devices have low resources, they can't technically afford of um, signing or in and applying a huge sort of um, strong uh, security algorithms. So we, we put, replace like a gateway uh, in, the, in between so that the gateway can handle all those um, processes and send the information to the cloud service providers. So although IoT offers quite a lot of uh, benefits, there are all challenges there as well. Uh, the first challenge we're discussing is that the, the existing solutions, as we've discussed, are centralized. So that means um, all the communications, uh, authentications, authorizations happens through this uh, central controller. So that means even if two devices um, are sitting in the same room and next to each other, if they want to talk to each other, they have to go through, uh, their packets have to go through technically the, the service provider. So 
considering IoT, where we have millions of devices, this solution might not be scalable because that's uh, central uh, central control level will become the uh, single point of failure, or will will have to tackle with a huge volume of uh, packets. Security and privacy are the other uh, significant challenges. So as I said, so the IoT devices have limited security or limited resources, so that they have uh, they come with even no security safeguards, built-in security safeguards. The embedded algorithms are quite weak, um, and normally they use default uh, sort of username and passwords. Um, so we have seen the Mirai botnet where it used um, all the IoT devices and then it um, launches a distributed denial of service attack uh, and was successful actually. Um, the other challenge is around the privacy. Um, so all these devices, all these sensors capture quite a lot of information about our daily lives. So assume that in, in your smart home, you have motion sensors, um, you have smart lights and do small doorbells and, and all these things that capture information about your daily life. So the service providers will technically have a um, huge volume of information about you, about different aspects, and technically they can build a virtual profile about uh, you, which will compromise your privacy. At the current and existing ecosystem, um, all the IoT uh, data has been stored by the cloud, uh, cloud service providers. So they maintain the data, they um, sort of process the data. So uh, as the user, you have no or very limited control over, uh, over your data and you can't technically monitor who the data has been shared with, what processing has been done on the data um, and, and all these things. And you technically trust that the service provider is actually doing, is, is technically honest and wouldn't do anything malicious against um, using your data or selling your data to someone else. So would there be any solution to, to these challenges and a couple of other challenges that exist in the current IoT ecosystem? So in this talk, we're going to discuss how blockchain can tackle um, these challenges and, and can benefit from that. So given that um, this is a talk in Hyperledger, uh, so we basically uh, skip the uh, basic introduction of blockchain. So I assume that everyone uh, in the call will know all the basics. Um, so, but what are the salient features of the blockchain that we can use and will, which makes it attractive for IoT? So blockchain uh, offers like a distributed management system. So in blockchain, we don't have any central server. So all the nodes are peers, so they can communicate, they, they sort of um, share information and uh, all together manage the system and reach consensus over the state of the ledger. So in blockchain, um, sort of modifying uh, or removing the content uh, of the blockchain database is impossible, which is called the, like the immutability feature. And that creates like a very attractive uh, feature for IoT that it offers also auditability and traceability because all the historical um, transactions are being stored in the blockchain and will be there permanently, technically. Blockchain achieves sort of distributed trust um, so two users might not necessarily trust each other, but they can trust the system, they can trust the, the framework, and they can trust that um, if something is happening on the blockchain according to the rules and the, the agreements, then um, they can trust on the other participants. Like when you're trading Bitcoin with someone else, you don't know that person, but technically because you trust the system, so you will, uh, you will trust that actually that um, payment will happen. Anonymity is the other feature which is um, interesting in blockchain uh, for IoT. In blockchain, the users are known by a public key um, and sort of we don't know about their real identity. So this makes um, them anonymous uh, and that can be an interesting thing for IoT, although it has some, some limitations as well, which we will discuss more. I mean, despite these uh, interesting features that blockchain have, uh, I mean, applying it in the IoT context isn't straightforward. So and in, it involves a couple of challenges. Today, we will discuss about scale and overheads, um, memory footprint and anonymity and privacy challenges involved with applying blockchain in the IoT context. So it worth mentioning that um, uh, by saying blockchain, we basically mean public blockchain. Um, so like Bitcoin and Ethereum, where the users can join. So 
Um, some of the discussions we have, um, so with the private blockchain, because of the scale, because of the trust levels, it might not be that much huge. Or, or I mean, of course, there are still a challenge, but it might not be that much huge. Uh, but most of our discussions are around uh, public blockchains. So scale and overheads. Um, in a blockchain system, transactions and blocks are broadcast and verified by all the participating nodes. So that means if a, if a new transaction, if a new block is generated in the network, it has to be broadcasted and this ties back to the distributed management of the blockchain. So where we're saying everyone can participate in managing the system. So at least if you want to receive this information, you will receive all the new blocks and the new transactions. In a blockchain system, multiple validators may attempt to store the same block simultaneously. So that means, I mean, we have also some sort of leader selection algorithms where you have a, like a leader which will um, store a block um, in a blockchain, a particular block. So then this wouldn't apply to them, but most of the existing consensus algorithms have like a leader, um, it are in a way that multiple validators simultaneously work on a single block. And then the one that solves the puzzle uh, or follows the consensus algorithm sooner would be the winner and can sort of store the, his block into the blockchain and the rest has to go and proceed with the next block. So this sort of um, lacks eff efficiency in the context of IoT. So we have delay and, and processing overhead for retrieving previously stored transactions in the blockchain. So in, in cryptocurrencies, we, this might not be that a big problem because uh, it's just one transaction in before and there's no that much frequent access to the data. But in IoT, we technically demand uh, frequent access to the data which has been stored. For instance, um, in a supply chain scenario, we need to go back and retrieve the historical view of the transactions and of the a particular product to make sure that actually it is it comes from where it claims to, right? So then we need to frequently access the previously stored information. So in blockchain, committing new blocks demand resources. This is ties back to the consensus algorithm. Um, so these resources can be computational resources, bandwidth, um, and also it has the delay in committing new transactions. Uh, there is a sort of a non-trivial delay, which is uh, even more in the public blockchains because that uh, to make sure that actually there's no malicious activity there. So we have to sort of um, add this delay a bit and also the nodes have to agree on which uh, state of the ledger and also receiving confirmation that is um, sort of to prevent double spending. Um, we need to receive confirmation uh, in the blockchain system to, to technically make sure that our transaction will be stored in the blockchain. Uh, most of the existing blockchains uh, suffer from uh, lack of throughput, uh, i.e. the total number of transactions that can be stored per second. Um, and that uh, is sort of a, a very huge problem in, in IoT because in IoT we have like millions of devices, millions of transactions. Uh, and so the system should be uh, scalable and should have that throughput to, to manage all this information. So technically, if the system doesn't have that throughput, though, there would be more delay, even more than uh, the existing delay with the consensus algorithms. So that, uh, that sort of create a big problem. So why scale and overheads and all these things that I've discussed are um, challenges in IoT? Because the IoT devices um, have limited resources. Technically, it can be computational, bandwidth, storage, or energy. So they don't have that much of uh, resources um, to spend on, on this uh, management of the blockchain system and their resources should be spent wisely for, for their own operation. So they're real time. Most of the IoT applications demand real time transaction settlement. Um, um, for instance, if you are in front of your door, you want to open the door. Technically, you can't wait for half an hour to, for the door to reopen. Uh, as I mentioned, in IoT, we demand frequent access to the data uh, and to the, to the technically transactions that we have stored because we want to audit. We want to make sure that everything is happening correctly and we need to sort of verify the integrity of information. And the other problem is that uh, the number of participants in the blockchain, the services that are, uh, the number of participants in IoT, the services that they offer, and all these are ever increasing. So new services are introduced, new people join, sort of mil millions of transactions just join and add it to the blockchain system and to the IoT system. So there are some solutions uh, proposed to address these sort of challenges in the literature. I will discuss this in a very high level and sort of categorical way. 
Um, so the first group of solutions are the hierarchical approaches where instead of having all the nodes um, in a single flat sort of blockchain layer, we will create so uh, private chains in different le levels and um, the transactions in each level are broadcast uh, only among the nodes in, in each level and um, the, sort of each blockchain uh, is connected to the parent. Uh, that can be by storing the hash of the blockchain or any other method. Um, so this will sort of, uh, to some extent, address the previous prob uh, problems that we have mentioned. For instance, you don't need to broadcast and verify everything in the main chain. Um, sort of the number of transactions in the main chain will significantly reduce because more of the transactions will be in the private chains. Um, sort of they will store here. It will in introduce more uh, sort of uh, privacy because less, inf less amount of information are stored here. Um, and also it will be easier to manage. But there are some drawbacks like centralization and, and the delay uh, involved. Sharding is another um, solution proposed in the literature where we create parallel uh, sort of ledgers where uh, the participants in each of the shards or the group of nodes in each of the shards will only manage the transactions within that shard. Uh, uh, and then sort of limiting the number of nodes in each shard and then they can communicate with the other nodes in the shard. Um, so technically, as um, sort of David mentioned, in theory, the, the increase in trans, um, transaction throughput is linear because, I mean, uh, if you have four shards, then the throughput will be four times more than um, the throughput of a flat sort of blockchain. There are challenges as well here, uh, for instance, how these shards can talk if uh, a transaction involves um, or needs verification of another transaction in another shard or if they want to talk. Um, but sharding is also a, a solution that has been proposed in the literature. So initially, blockchain came with uh, Bitcoin and the proof of work. Um, however, we all know that proof of work isn't that much effective in terms of energy and, and all the challenges we have mentioned. So new consensus algorithm have been proposed in the literature, like proof of stake, where um, the validator of the next block uh, is um, sort of decided based on uh, this, the amount of a stake they lock in the blockchain, and then the more the stake you lock, the, the, the higher would be the chance uh, of being the next validator. Um, proof of lapse time is an algorithm proposed by Intel. Technically, it's um, it, it depends on uh, it relies on a hardware um, Intel CPUs, and the way it works is technically saying that um, whenever a node or a validator wants to generate a block it has to wait for a particular period of time, uh, for a random period of time. And that, that random period of time is generated in a trusted execution environment, which is built in, in C Intel CPUs. So that means, and, and that is in a way that others can also verify that you have waited for that period of time. So that technically means that um, this algorithm will rely and will require all the participants to, to sort of have um, Intel CPUs. So proof of authority, again, is this a, a consensus algorithm based on the reputation of the nodes. Algorand also uses a kind of a, a sort of a version of proof of stake where um, sort of depending on the, um, depending on your assets that you have and the credits in the system, um, they will select a committee of the nodes. And then from that committee, one of the nodes will be selected as the validator of the next block. I mean, of course, we have all these uh, optimized uh, consensus algorithm and many more uh, consensus algorithms that are uh, even defined uh, each and every day. So they, all, they have some limitations like um, throughput management. So when we're talking about throughput management, it's not just saying having high throughput. Uh, it, we, in IoT, we demand a system which would be self-scaling. So that means if the number of um, transactions increases, if the load in the network increases, the system should be able to handle that. Uh, overheads in terms of computational um, bandwidth overhead efficiency, as we discussed, most of them work on, um, in most of them, multiple validators have to work on the same block and the delay in committing transactions as we discussed. So I'm just discussing um, some of the solutions that we have proposed um, in our earlier researches. Um, one solution is called uh, Lightweight Scalable Blockchain or LSV that we have um, proposed in 2017 and the, the extension version published in 2019. So based on LSV, 
we so LSV technically relies on a network which is cluster. So that means we have the overlay network. The overlay network technically is the, the blockchain network, the peer-to-peer -peer network. So we divide the overlay network into different clusters. And then um, the clusters, only the cluster heads, which we call them overlay block managers, will sort of um, participate in managing the blockchain. So that means the cluster members don't need to be involved in the in management of the blockchain. They don't receive the transactions and blocks, and only the transactions and blocks are broadcast uh, among the overlay block managers. So we have proposed a couple of algorithms, like a distributed time-based consensus algorithm, a distributed trust algorithm, and throughput management algorithm, which I will go through them and um, sort of briefly mention, explain. Some fundamental co uh, concepts in LSB will separate the traffic flow or the transaction flow from the data flow. So if um, a traffic or transaction are broadcast, we don't broadcast the data. Uh, so the IoT data is stored off the chain, which is um, common in most I IoT applications. Um, and uh, the overlay block managers will also do access control. So that means um, the cluster members can set policies uh, on who can access them. And then the overlay block manager will follow those policies and forwarding the transactions and blocks uh, to each of the uh, cluster members. To limit the spam accounts in, in, in LSV, we are relying on a certificate authority that the nodes needs to uh, receive a certificate from a certificate authority, or they need to burn coin in a Bitcoin system so that they will be able to create an account in, in LSV. Okay, so the first algorithm that we have proposed is the distributed time-based consensus algorithm, DTC. Um, the, the high level concept is that we are saying that one, uh, each validator in the network, each OBM, can generate one block per consensus period. So for instance, here the consensus period is 10 minutes, so each of these nodes is allowed to create one block per 10 minutes. So there would be a random waiting time before block generation uh, to prevent um, sort of um, simultaneous um, storage of a block. And also to ensure that the nodes will follow the algorithms, we rely on um, neighbor monitoring or algorithms. So we're saying, for instance, in this example, assume that this OVM is a malicious node and creates blocks in one minute time intervals. So what will happen is that the neighbors will receive the block, they will verify the first block and they will broadcast the first block, but the second and the third block wouldn't um, match with the consensus period because the consensus period is 10 minutes. So uh, this node has to wait for 10 minutes um, to be able to uh, generate another block in the blockchain. So then the block two and three will be discarded by the other participating nodes. So then technically um, the security of uh, LSV will rely on neighbor monitoring algorithms. So as I mentioned, in, in conventional blockchains, the nodes has to sort of um, verify all the new blocks and transactions. And that will create a huge overhead for even verifying the, what has already been stored in the blockchain. Uh, to address this limitation or this challenge, um, we introduced a distributed trust algorithm where then it, it relies on two trust models, like the direct evidence and indirect evidence. So the direct evidence is um, if, overlay, if cluster head uh, A has uh, previously verified a block generated by cluster head B, then they have direct evidence. And indirect evidence is uh, if cluster head A has not previously verified something generated by cluster head B, but it has verified something generated by cluster head C, and C says that B is trusted. So in that case, um, it, there would be an indirect uh, evidence about, about the, this block generated by B. So they will build up trust as, as shown here, as the number of previously validated blocks increases. Uh, you can see that then the percentage of transactions that need to be verified in a block will, be, de will decrease. So this table is just an example. Um, the point is that the, the percentage of transactions that need to be verified never should reach uh, zero um, because there's no absolute trust in the network. And it has to be defined based on the uh, number of validators and number of cluster heads in the network. Um, okay, so this will, uh, will sort of help uh, reducing the overheads and this percentage is sort of a randomly selected number of nodes in the in the new blocks uh, to make sure that actually 
um, if there is an invalid transaction, per, uh, at least one of the nodes in the network will be able to capture that. So we talked about the throughput management algorithms. So we are proposing a distributed throughput management algorithm where we are defining a utilization value. Um, the utilization depends on N, which is the number of nodes in each cluster, R, which is the load of them, and the consensus period, uh, divided by T max, which is the, the maximum number of transactions in each block, and the total number of OBMs in the network. So the aim is here um, is to sort of keep uh, alpha between an alpha min and alpha max, which can be like zero and one. Uh, and if um, alpha exceeds alpha max, that means the load is more than what the network can store in the blockchain. So what will happen is that um, LSP has two tunable parameters. So one is the consensus period. So first they will try to reduce the consensus period. So that means uh, previously, for instance, the consensus period was 10 minutes. Now they will reduce it to five minutes. So that means they can store more transactions. But then there, there is a minimum threshold for that, which is the two times a maximum end-to-end uh, -end delay in the network to make sure that actually a new block generated will reach to the other nodes in the network. And when the consensus period hit that minimum, uh, the, what they will do is that they will uh, tune or increase the number of overlay block managers in the network uh, or increasing the value of M. So this way, actually, the LSV ensures that uh, they can actually manage um, the throughput and achieve self-scaling. And the beauty is that it, it not only manages when the load increases, but if the load even decreases and then we have more throughput than uh, what the network requires, it can reduce um, the number of blocks or the consensus period uh, in a way that um, the, the resources are not wasted. So here are a couple of results with probably I'll skip um, just in a matter of time. Um, so we recently are working in another project called uh, Three Chain Project, uh, where we are trying to build a new optimized blockchain for IoT, considering different aspects of the blockchain. Uh, our first work is on the consensus and on the computational overhead around consensus and delay which uh, the results is in the paper occurring tree chain and, and the architecture is shown here. So the, the key concept between uh, of the tree chain is that we will have, instead of having a single ledger, we are having multiple parallel ledgers um, that each of these ledgers is managed by a particular node in the network. So say, let's say that a particular validator. So we have, as you can see here, um, five uh, validators in the network and these five validators, um, each of them will manage one of these ledgers. So then they know, oops, so they know what they are uh, supposed to manage and what they have to do in the network. Some very basic concepts. Um, uh, tree chain relies on the hash functions. So hash function is the main um, point or the main function that tree chain is using, which is in all the blockchains. So in a hash function, the output normally is um, something like this, as alpha one, alpha two, and um, the K would be the size of the, um, the hash function output. So technically what tree chain is doing is that um, we are defining a consensus code range. So what is consensus code range? It, it refers to the most significant bits of the hash function output. For instance, if the size of the consensus code range is one, then it would be just alpha one. And then, the size of the consensus code range depends on how many validators we have in the network. So for instance, you can see that the possible values in the hash function can be like uh, numbers or alphabets, right? These would be like 62 values. So if we have 63 value, uh, validators in the network, then the size of the consensus code range would be two. So we are also defining a weight dictionary a weight dictionary is um, the weight corresponding to each possible value in the hash function output. So that means, for instance, that each of these values uh, is allocated to a weight in the network. And we have a key weight metric, which is the metric referring to the cumulative weight of each hash function output, which can be technically a public key. For instance, um, to calculate the KWM for this public key, or which is, this is like the hash of the public key. So we would say based on the, this uh, weight uh, dictionary, 
um, we will grab the weight corresponding to each of these values and 482 would be the KWM value for um, this public key. So again, um, tree chain is a leader selection algorithm. So we select a leader for each of the ledgers and we rely on the hash function output, which is sort of a hash function output is a random algorithm. So we rely on the hash function output uh, for um, managing this and for selecting the validator of each block. So the randomization achieves in two levels. The first level is the transaction level. So what the transaction level means, um, is that for each transaction, um, the validator is randomly selected based on the hash of the transaction content. So for instance, here, the transaction uh, ID or the hash of the transaction content starts with a letter D, right? So, and from the table below, we see that the, this public, uh, this sort of validator with ID 13, with this public key is responsible for storing transactions uh, that the consensus code range um, starts with D, right? So that means we randomly allocate each transaction to one of the validators in the network so that, and the other one is in the blockchain level. So the blockchain level is that, again, we randomly allocate the consensus code range to one of the validators. So during the bootstrapping, when we generate this um, Genesis block, we will sort of um, gather information about all the nodes that want to be validators, and we will divide the, and prepare the, like the consensus code range, depending on their, uh, how many nodes we have. And then we will say, uh, for each of these validators, we calculate the KWM, the node with the highest KWM would uh, be allocated to the first consensus code range, and so on and so forth, right? So for, for instance, in here, we see that the node that is responsible for this ledger um, is the node who has to collect all the transactions where the hash of the transaction content starts with letters A to M. So this way, tree chain technically achieves two levels of randomization where uh, a validator is randomly uh, allocated to a consensus code range and a transaction again is randomly allocated to a validator in the network and to achieve the security. So there's no other uh, sort of um, algorithm needed for to follow um, for storing or committing new blocks to the blockchain. So that means uh, that makes reaching actually very fast. So once a node receives a transaction that falls within this consensus code range, so it has to just um, collect them uh, when the size of the pending transactions reach the predefined threshold, then it will broadcast a new block. And, with, and the, the thing is that because they are chained it to their own ledger, they don't need to wait for, um, and there, would, there wouldn't be any forking technically because each of these ledgers, um, each of these ledgers has this unique validator dedicated to that ledger, which always they know and the hash of the previous ledger. Uh, in some cases, the load in the network may increase over the time, depending on what's the period between um, uh, reforming the network or creating these two gen uh, different genesis blocks. So then if that's the case, a node might uh, request for a new validator to join the network and then they will divide um, the consensus code range between each other that will um, create a forking in the network. So um, again, the hash function is random. We, we can't guarantee that the load will be exactly divided between these two nodes, but at least it will be reduced. And the ledger reformation is that um, to prevent the nodes from malicious activities and all these things. So during each epoch times, uh, the nodes has to reform and restructure the network. Um, they will create another Genesis block and uh, all the nodes has to select a new public key. And if the new nodes want, wants to join, they, will, they can join and then um, a new sort of ledger and new allocations will be Created. As you can see here, we have more validators, so the consensus code range is now smaller than before. Double spending, I mean, uh, three chain is basically developed for um, IoT applications where we, we don't have that much of transferring assets, but there are cases that we need to transfer assets and we need to protect against double spending. Uh, so we are discussing how three chain will protect against double spending. Um, 
the one way to to for a successful double spending attack, and because the, remember that the hash of the transaction is random, right? So if you want to create uh, two transactions, then technically they have to go to two different validators. You don't know who would that validators would be. Uh, one key concept that we have here is that the validator of the input transaction uh, has to sign the transaction that is going to be a spend. So that means if I'm validator A and I have received a transaction that uses um, a, a transaction mined by validator B as the input, then I have to sign, send this transaction to the valid to validator B and ask. So you can you you should sign this transaction for me. And then when that uh, validator signs that transaction, so that means this transaction has not been already spent. So when the validator B signs that transactions, it will set a flag for that transaction saying that this transaction has been spent. Um, and it will send the signature to me and the signed transaction to me. I will use and I will store the signed transaction to the blockchain. Um, so now the, the only possible way to do this attack is that I'm controlling validator B. So if I'm controlling validator B, then I will technically sign the both transactions saying that it's, no, it's not been spent while I'm, I'm sort of malicious and sort of claiming something false. So what will happen is that over the time, so when the other validators would receive these blocks, they will verify it and they will make sure that actually if there is a double spending or not. And then it, when they detect that, they know who is responsible for that because it's only the validator B who is claiming false. So we know who to blame. And um, that's uh, like another beauty of 3Chain, which, uh, which, uh, which makes it clear who is responsible for the attack. And then that node will be isolated from the network. OK, so um, some of the results, as you can see here, um, the processing overhead for uh, storing a new transaction in the blockchain uh, is quite um, low. Um, and uh, which makes three chain quite fast in terms of storing new blocks and new transactions in the blockchain. So here's the load balancing, which I will skip. And um, another uh, aspect of three chain is because of uh, because we know where each transaction has been stored. So we technically, um, so if you want to retry the transaction, we don't need to go through um, all the database, all the blockchain database. We technically can only go through and uh, search in the ledger corresponding to that uh, transaction based on the hash of the transaction content, which will significantly reduce the retrieving time. And as you can see, as the number of validators increases, the number of transactions in each ledger will decrease technically, and then it will lead to shorter period of time for searching. So that means we technically, when we are storing information in blockchain, we are categorizing them to reduce this time. OK, so this is all about um, scale and overheads. Um, the next challenge we're going to discuss would be about the memory footprint of the blockchain or the storage aspect of the blockchain. Blockchain is immutable, right? Um, it, 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 immutability helps uh, security, helps auditability, helps to pr protect a uh, double spending attack. But there are some other aspects of it as well. We will face with an ever increasing database, which we can't technically remove information from that database. So the size of the current Bitcoin blockchain is 310 gigabytes. And um, consider an IoT with millions of transactions, the size will be significantly larger and, and sort of how we, can, how, how we can sort of manage this database. Privacy is another issue. So Blockchain will, when you store something in blockchain, that will remain there, right? So you can't control anything. So what if one of your keys is leaked or what if um, using techniques that I will later mention, someone de-anonymizes you and they know your real identity. They know your real identity, they know your keys and technically all your information is in the blockchain. So you, you cannot do anything about that. Um, and sort of they will have all the information there. Of course, the, the data normally is encrypted and normally is not stored in the blockchain, but even the pattern of communications and even the pattern of uh, interactions would be enough for the attackers. Uh, regulations like GDPR, the users and the, uh, the users demand the right for the data to be forgotten. Uh, 
that's not possible in blockchain and also what if someone stores something illegal in, in the blockchain database well, how, how can we tackle with that um, sort of in illegal information in the blockchain so there are some solutions proposed again in the literature and one of them is to store the data off chain so that means we will store the data associated with the RET devices in an off chain database and we will have the hash of that data in the blockchain as a sort of evidence that we will, we will not change the data over the period of time. Uh, of course, this will uh, help improving um, or reducing the size of the blockchain database. But uh, again, we will still need to store millions of transactions in the blockchain database, uh, which will again increase the size of the database. So some algorithms like the chameleon hash function, they allow you to modify the data but still have the same uh, hash value or still be able to validate the same hash value. So this way you can technically um, create and use this type of hash function. And then over the time, you can technically modify the data or modify transactions or modify even the contents of a block and then uh, still ensure the blockchain consistency. Um, so as you can see here, a very high level view of how a chameleon hash function works is a, when you want to generate a key, you will input a secret value, it will create a hash key and a tractor key. So this tractor key is technically the key that you will use uh, for creating a collision. So when you want to create a hash, uh, you will send the message, the hash key, and there would be a string and a hash value as the output. So you will require this string for verification. And this is a string is technically what allows you to sort of create a collision. When you want to create a collision, you will send the new message, the previous message, the hash of the previous message, and the tractor key and the a string of the previous message to the algorithm, and it will create a new string. So that new string can be used uh, to uh, with the verification algorithm to sort of, uh, and it, with the new message and it will say that uh, it is verified and the hash will match right so that that uh, prevent any inconsistency in the network other methods will rely uh, on summarizing say of uh, the transactions like mimble wimble which is employed in um, bitcoin uh, the idea here is that when you have a group of transactions so technically what you can do is that um, you can group them as one transaction and you will uh, ignore the transactions or, or input outputs that are already spent in these transactions. So for instance, transaction one uh, output two uh, is used as the input of transaction two, right? So we don't need to include neither uh, output two nor uh, input five in this final transaction. And, but for instance, here, output two is sent somewhere else, probably will be, will be used uh, somewhere else in the network um, in the future transactions. So we need to include it in here. There is also encryptions for the input output values and other algorithms that Mimble, Mimble will use, but this is the very summary of what they do to, to sort of make sure that the uh, database size is small. We have also proposed a solution called uh, MoFPC, Memory Optimized and Flexible Blockchain, which will allow the users to sort of experience the right to be forgotten, for the data to be forgotten, and uh, allows the users to remove information from the blockchain. Uh, technically, what we are doing is that we are introducing a new layer called MoFPC layer on top of the blockchain, existing blockchains. Um, and then this layer will manage all the removable, removal of transactions. So very high level view on the, how it will work. So is that technically in conventional blockchains, when you want to calculate the hash of the block, you will hash the contents of all transactions uh, and the block header. What we are proposing is that uh, instead of the content, we technically can use the transaction ID, which is again, the hash of the content of the transaction. And if we want to remove a transaction, we simply will remove the content, but keep the, uh, keep the transaction ID in the blockchain. So that means um, still there would be a level of auditability. There would be um, the nodes will still be able to verify this um, and to uh, verify all the transactions um, and the consistency is maintained. So in IoT, users demand different types of um, flexibility. Demand the flexibility in storing the transactions. So you don't need you don't necessarily might not need to store your transactions permanently. 
and uh, say that you sign the contract with the service provider for one year. After one year, you don't need those transactions as a record. Uh, so we're introducing temporary transactions for these cases. Uh, we're introducing summarizable transactions where, I mean, this is similar to the concept in Mimble Wimble, but um, all these transactions belong to the same user. So in Mimble Wimble, it can be different users. Uh, here we're saying that each user can uh, summarize all these transactions to a single user transaction, which will contain all the information about this transaction. So that means the auditability will still be achieved, uh, but you have to technically store this transaction up the chain. Aging means that um, if you are, if the transaction has a hash of a, a data which is stored in a cloud, you technically can remove. Um, you technically can uh, co compress that data in the cloud to, re and to save uh, to help saving the space. Then uh, you can update your transaction in the blockchain to, to refer to the aged data and the permanent, uh, which is as always. So in MoFBC, we are introducing a storage fee, which is um, basically uh, in conventional blockchains, they charge for the computational resources they need, uh, the validators need to allocate. But in MoFPC, we are saying that in IoT, storage will also be something important. So we have to go uh, charge the users for the amount of transaction they start, they're um, generating and uh, to be paid for the, to the nodes that store the blockchain. So this is uh, basically saying how the share for each of the nodes that are storing the blockchain will be calculated. In, in summary, it's like, uh, what is the size of the blockchain? Um, what is the amount of the database you are storing and for how long? And depending on that, uh, there will be a share for each of the nodes. Using even this storage, we will motivate and incentivize the users to remove their transactions from the blockchain, saying that if you want to generate a new transaction and you had a previous transaction in the blockchain, so why not removing that one and, and, and you can store a new one for free. So that means you wouldn't need to pay the storage fee. So this way we're trying to incentivize the users to remove transactions. Otherwise, uh, the user might not find uh, enough incentive to, to remove their transactions from the blockchain. Um, we allow transaction removals to, be, to happen in different layers. In the user can remove, a service provider can remove. Uh, if this is any case like um, a user is hacked or is malicious and storing something illegal and the network can do it. Uh, for instance, if a user wants to offload all the overheads to the network. When a user or a service provider wants to remove a transaction, uh, that transaction, so that means the transaction has, is already in the blockchain. So the first step is that you have to prove that you are the owner of that transaction. So how you will do it? Normally you use public key and signature. But then in IoT, when we have millions of transactions and each transaction probably with a new public key, how you're gonna store all those public keys and keep track of uh, which transaction is generated with which of the public keys. So then the key management would be a problem. So we are introducing um, generator verifier concept. So this is basically saying that um, we create a hash of a signed value, which is uh, the previous transaction ID and a secret value. And this would be unique for each transaction. So that means um, for each transaction, this would be unique. And to show that you are the owner of that transaction, you need to reveal the, you need to prove that you know the private key associated with this public key. And you know also the hash of the GBS. So this will help the other nodes to create this value and then also create this value sort of um, to prove that you are the owner of that transaction. So basically with the network doing that, so that you don't need to tackle or struggle with the key management because you will um, uh, have all this, and you will say to the network that you have to do this and you will set up the conditions when you're generating the transaction. So that technically that means all those information is included within the, the signed hash in the transaction content. And we will introduce fields like um, memory optimization mode and the memory optimization setup. For instance, if it's a temporary transaction, then we have to uh, remove the transaction from the blockchain. Um, some of the results that showing that the, it would improve um, the memory overhead. And here is a, a recent uh, work on, on, again, tackling the same problem. But here, instead of having, um, the MOF BC layer on top, we are introducing a layer between the peer-to-peer -peer network and the main chain. Um, 
So technically, we are saying that um, if you want to store information in the blockchain, you should you can decide on whether you want it to permanent to be permanently stored in a public blockchain, or you want to store it in a sort of a temporary chain uh, where the data would be immutable, would be trusted for a particular period of time, and after that it would be removed from the ledger. Uh, we we introduced two techniques. Um, one is Blackboard. So Blackboard is technically a public uh, uh, database where everyone can uh, sort of read, but no one can write. Only authorized users can write. And this is uh, building on the assumption that uh, there is a trusted third party there. So we uh, studied this in the context of energy trading. Uh, and the assumption was that, so we have the grid operator uh, and we trust them. Basically, they are running the network. They are providing with the like transmission lines and all these things. Um, so we, there is a level of trust there. So then we can use that trust level and saying that, okay, you manage this database. Or if we don't want the, to trust to anyone, we can technically have a removable ledger applying the same concept as Move PC and saying that all the transactions here would be temporary. And this removable ledger would be managed by the validators in the public blockchain. So that means in a public blockchain, if you're generating a new block, Technically, you will also add the hash of the transactions in the removable ledger from your perspective. And then you will create a new block in the removable ledger. Uh, and then you will broadcast both these blocks, the new blocks in the main chain and the new blocks in temporary chain. And uh, if your block has been accepted in the main chain, your block will, will also be accepted in temporary chain. Okay, so these are basically the solutions we had and the challenges for memory optimizations. And last but not least, a very important problem uh, is around anonymity and privacy. So we know that blockchain is anonymous, right? So we know that uh, one, all the users in the blockchain system are known by a public key. So, and this public key can be changed per transaction per device. So that means if uh, Bob has 10 devices, uh, each of those devices will have a different public key. And, and each transaction generated by that device will have will be using a different public key again. Um, anonymity basically has been studied in cryptocurrencies. Um, so at least we haven't found any sort of uh, work doing on anonymity around um, uh, IoT applications in um, in blockchains. So most of my discussions will focus on cryptocurrencies, but the same concept can be applied on on other blockchains and other applications as well. So that means um, the concept would be similar. So we have different attributes for anonymity. Um, one is the anonymity of an entity. So we're saying that when an entity is creating something, uh, transactions in the blockchain, you, others shouldn't be able to find out about the real identity. Uh, recipient anonymity means that if I'm transferring assets to someone, uh, that uh, was the the, the person who's being paid, technically, um, it, its identity should remain anonymous. Uh, we shouldn't be able to link different transactions or even trace different, um, link different transactions to a user or trace the previous transactions generated by the same user. Um, the values uh, used in a transaction, like the input output values, uh, should, uh, should be remain hidden, or technically, they, we're using encryption for this part. And metadata on linkability, which is uh, more common in IoT. So when we have metadata, uh, we should make sure that actually um, with having that metadata, someone else cannot sort of uh, find out about our other transactions or try to link different transactions that we have generated to a single um, and, and sort of create a pool of our transactions and try to de-anonymize us. So then your deniability is also something that um, is the future of encryption. So user de-anonymization or the attacks against anonymity and privacy in IoT. So one way to do the user de-anonymization is to have an active interaction with the user. So that means if a user is offering a sort of, if, if a user is selling something using Bitcoin or something, then we can try to buy with different public keys and try to capture the public keys they use, the information they are offering. And using this information, try to sort of uh, gather information and sort of um, de-anonymize the user. 
We can also analyze the network traffic in terms of the IP addresses, linking them to the users or the network level traffic. So this is basically saying that um, in blockchain, we have entry points. So that means um, when a new node wants to join the blockchain system, they have to go through uh, one node to connect them to the network. So you can uh, join and sort of listen to the nodes who are connecting to that entry point and sort of link the IP addresses of the nodes with the public key. Uh, we can also analyze the off-chain data. Um, it's like uh, a company may reveal their public key in their website and so a user might reveal their public key in a forum or something like that. But the most complicated way of um, sort of analyzing the transactions is through the transaction graph and the address graphs. So basically here the concept is that um, say T1 is a transaction, it uses two public keys as the input and two public keys as the output. So with, this, with the transaction graph, we're just simply creating saying this type of graph saying what, are, what is the transaction, what are the inputs and what are the outputs. With the address graph, we rely on some sort of um, concepts. Uh, for instance, one is um, if a user is sort of spending two transactions as an input, so then these two transactions belong to the same user. So that means that's technically because the user knows the private key corresponding to both of these, right? Um, so that means here we can say P1 either belongs to P7 or to P8, technically to the owner of P7 or to the P8. The same applies to P2. And sort of this, using this way, we'll create an address graph, which we then can analyze and go to a user graph, which we would say, what are the transactions or what are the public keys a user has used and what are the transactions we and, and sort of trying to de-anonymize the users, which is a bit of a complicated method. But um, the studies show that it can be successful. How to protect against these attacks? Um, mixing servers. So basically, uh, they will um, receive some inputs. They will uh, generate outputs with new keys and sort of mixing the previous one, uh, removing the historical view of the transactions. Um, we can rely on cryptographic methods like blind signature when um, you hide the actual value of a field, but the others can accept it and uh, can sign that value. We, have, we can use the ring signature to remain anonymous among a group of nodes. So then technically we don't know who, what exactly is the node or who, which of the nodes has actually signed the transaction, but we know that one of the nodes in that group has the and another very interesting aspect is when machine learning comes into play. Um, so we know that in IoT, everything, all the transactions will correspond to the, I mean, they can be generated by devices, right? And they can, they may or may not include data. So let's assume the worst case, let's assume that we don't have any data uh, or the data has been encrypted, right? But all we, all we have is the sort of a transactions generated by devices. And we know that, right? We know that they are generated by devices. The thing is that the devices will generate transactions with a particular pattern, right? The same concept applies to IoT even, that where you can sit in the network traffic and listen to the traffic. And based on that, you can say what type of devices you might have in the network. The beauty of blockchain is that uh, you don't need real-time access, right? Uh, because blockchain has the historical view uh, and information of the system. So what you can do is that you can apply machine learning algorithms on top of blockchain and train your algorithm with the different data sets and see if any of those devices are installed in a smart home, in, in, in an IoT setting. We have done this um, in an IoT, in a smart home setting. We, we use the smart home data with traffic data set we populated a blockchain accordingly. So for each of the communications, we created a transaction. There was no data stored on the blockchain and that was being stored on the blockchain database. Um, on top of that, we applied machine learning. So we applied different type of machine learnings here on this discussing the informed attack type where the attacker knows the type of device. So that means the attacker knows that this traffic comes from a smart home, right? And it knows that uh, technically what devices can be stored in, in a smart home. So to protect against, um, to protect, uh, to enhance the privacy, um, we have proposed some obfuscation methods like we propose delayed transactions where um, instead of when, when a communication happens, you, you wouldn't uh, immediately create a transaction. 
you will wait for a random period of time and then you will create the transaction. Uh, when we have multiple nodes per ledger, so that means the transactions in a single ledger might be shared with multiple nodes, and then we have multiple packet per transaction. So that means, say that when the device created 10 packets, we will create a summary of all those 10 packets and create the transaction accordingly that will be sent to the blockchain. So all these methods will break the patterns, right? So the, the way that machine learning is using to, to identify the users is technically um, using the patterns that there exist in the transactions and in the transaction flow. So here you can see that the, when we have the different number of devices per ledger, uh, you can see that um, initially when we had two devices or one device, we had a very high success rate and actually could classify the type of devices. And it increases to 50% um, where we could classify and we could say what type of devices has been installed in that smart home. And you can see that the, the obfuscation methods we're proposing will reduce the chance, but it's still there is a chance um, that detecting that um, what devices have been installed and compromising the privacy. So here as well, you can see that um, again, we use multiple packets per transactions. You can see that we are still able to sort of identify what um, devices have been installed and what using multiple packets will reduce the chance. And the same concept applies to when we have multiple devices per ledger. So these results uh, basically show that um, when we have blockchain, we can um, blockchain for IoT, we can apply machine learning algorithms on top of that to identify the users uh, and to, to link, um, to identify the devices, to identify and then link that devices to a particular user. So that would be a, like a huge risk against privacy because remember that we said that blockchain is immutable, that all your uh, history of information will be publicly available in blockchain and you can't do anything about it. If, if the users are successful in de-anonymizing you, then technically it would be there forever. There are some other um, challenges around anonymity in IoT as well, and that's the trade-off that we have between privacy and trust. So if we want to trust someone, we have to know who they are, right? But in blockchain system, we technically don't know who they are and because the other user also don't want us to know. Uh, let me explain that through an example here. Assume that this is an energy trading example. And uh, this home uh, on the left side um, has a solar panels, has excess energy, you want to sell energy. And the other home here on the right side has basically um, is a consumer. It needs energy. So the consumer wants to buy energy and there are nodes in the network saying that, hey, we, are, uh, we have solar panels, we have excess energy, uh, buy from us pay us that I will send you energy. So uh, how this uh, consumer can actually trust that the node who is saying I'm a smart, I'm a solar panel is actually a solar panel or, or has excess energy. What, how we make sure that it's not an attacker uh, that wants to sort of just charge us for nothing, right? But, and so here the consumer demands to know that um, when you're saying you're a solar panel or you have excess energy, I have to make sure that actually you're right, right? But again, the producer don't want to reveal his identity because if it's revealed the identity, then people can track uh, the energy consumption generation. People can track the profit it will get um, for selling and, and uh, for selling the excess energy and all the information, such information. And even there would be like safety concerns because if you know the energy consumption, the real time energy consumption of a smart home of a home, you can technically guess uh, when someone is home or when someone isn't home. Uh, so, Ali, Ali, I think yeah. we're, coming over, we're over the hour now. <laughs> uh, so I think this is my last slide. I'll okay. probably, yeah, we'll quickly go uh, over that. So, uh, so we proposed like a solution for that, which is um, a certificate of existence saying that, so here we are building on the concept that the smart meters have uh, trust each other. Um, uh, and they are tamper resistance, basically. So what is happening is that the manufacturer of the smart meters will generate a set of uh, one public key, private key pairs, in, and then they will populate that in the meet and the smart meter. When the meter is deployed, it will generate a number of public key, private key, create a Merkle tree using the public keys, and then send that information to another meter in the network. 
So then the verifier meter or the meter who is receiving the information will sort of um, verify that this information comes from a genuine smart meter using the certificate um, authority, which is the manufacturer. And then it will sign the route. So this route is basically used as the uh, certificate of existence. And whenever in the, the, the device wants to generate a transaction, it will just populate the route, the signed route and uh, uses one of the public keys used in the Mercury tree. So the, all the nodes can see is that a uh, verifier meter has signed this, but technically it's not the verifier meter who's using this transaction, also who's generating this transaction. So there's no link between the verifier meter and the, meter, the actual meter who's generating this. So then we can trust that it is a smart meter, but in the meantime, we are protecting the privacy of the uh, user who's using this. And Again, we have covered uh, scale and overheads, memory and the anonymity, which are the key um, challenges in adopting blockchain in IoT. And uh, thanks for your attention. I think we'll be a bit over time, but thanks, thanks for your attention, everyone. No problem, no problem. So uh, I think normally we finish in an hour I, I, at these, these things, but I think we've got, we've got have a few questions. So we have sure. a first question. Can you see the questions? Can you pick out the questions from the, from the chat? I just asked, yeah. and anyone else who has a question, you know, just pipe up. I think we'll just have a, maybe answer a few questions. Tree so, chain. Yeah, you yeah. See that. So they said, um, so they said uh, in food supply chain, we probably don't need to store data permanently. Can we do it in a non-permanent manner? Uh, yes, I mean, that's technically why we are saying that uh, we need sort of temporary transactions in IoT because um, in IoT, it's not like an estate that we have to go through everything from the beginning. So it's like a, a meat generated somewhere and it's been once the consumer bought it and it's done, right? So we don't need the record of that uh, probably. So we don't need to store that information in the blockchain, uh, in the public blockchain at least. Uh, we can uh, still make sure that there is, would be auditability by storing the hashes. Um, and that's how and why we're suggesting that the hash of this information has to be stored in the public blockchain. Uh, how, how is a malicious node identified because validator happens on chosen nodes based on the hash value? So in, in sort of a, in tree chain, we basically um, are saying that the validators have to again go and receive a certificate from a certificate authority. Then that certificate authority might request for the real identity, might be like burning point in Bitcoin to, to protect the anonymity, but uh, to prevent um, like cyber attack, what, as what you mentioned, uh, we do require to limit the spam accounts and we do it uh, by relying on a certificate authority. And I think those are the questions. Um, maybe. Thank you, that, that, that was excellent. Um... A lot of detail there. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, and uh, so, any any other questions? I think we'd, we'd probably run out of time anyway, right? Um, so, uh, Vipin, do you want to finish with anything? Um, we've got lots of people. Most comments here are excellent. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, Vipin, do you want to add anything, add anything to, to to this? I think he's having problems with his. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, this is Nima here, so okay. I'll, I'll thank uh, and thank Ali for for the great talk. This is uh, exactly why 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 we invited Ali here because he's uh, he's an expert in the in the problems that uh, blockchain faces and when entering the IoT market. Uh, so yeah, so uh, it would be. We would be very interested to have you, Ali, on board the, the, the Telecom SIG in Hyperledger, uh, as well as uh, the, the, other, the other attendees here. So joining Telecom SIG is, is quite simple, and we're open for, for everyone to join. Just, uh, just search us online, uh, find our wiki, and join the, join the member list, and uh, we'll send you emails about the next events. Thanks again, Ali. For, for joining thanks. us yeah thanks for thanks time. thanks ali and uh, thanks for new concepts like tree chain temporary immutability certificate of existence like really really new concepts and thanks for sharing i want uh, to add one more point ali can you share your all papers to us so that we can share it on our telecom sig as well so that everyone can read yeah yeah that's not a problem yeah yeah
Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Okay. Take care, everyone. Keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.